Okay, now we are live. Welcome to the December edition of the webinar of EMS webinar. This is the last edition of 2023. And uh, this time we, it was a long year and uh, we are really happy to have uh, Susanna Nunes with us, uh, the last uh, webinar. And uh, I will like to say that uh, we are really happy to host uh, Susanna. She will give uh, the scientific uh, lecture. Then it will be just a few uh, slides referring to the new activity and uh, also, as usual, uh, answer a question time. Uh, I will introduce now Susanna. She is really well known in membrane science and technology. Uh, she is the vice provost for faculty and academic affairs at KAUST in South Africa, in sorry, Saudi Arabia. <laughs> sorry, Susanna, where she is the professor of chemical and environmental science and engineering. She has a PhD in chemistry from the University of Campinas, Brazil. Uh, was an Humboldt postdoc fellow in polymer physical chemistry at the Johannes uh, Gutenberg University, visiting scientist at the Max Planck for uh, Polymer Science in Mainz, Germany, and also Tokyo Institute of Technology, and the research in membranes for renewable energy at Helmholtz Association in Germany. She's a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry in UK and of the Sao Paulo Academy of Science in Brazil. She's the laureate of the 2023 L'Oreal UNESCO for Women in Science International Award for Africa and the Arab States, recognized for her achievement in chemistry. She is an associate editor of the ACS Applied Chemistry Material, member of the Journal Membrane Science Board. Her lab is dedicated to the development and characterization of new polymeric materials, their translation into membranes for liquid, gas, and vapor separation. Uh, she targets sustainable separation that would enable less energy intense process in the chemical, petrochemical and pharmaceutical industries. And uh, today she will talk, uh, she will speak about polymer membranes, simplicity, scalability and sustainability. Thank you, Susanna, for being with us and I leave you the floor. Thank you very much, Elena. It's a really a pleasure to talk in for the EMS and uh, really a pleasure to just to, to have a, a show some of my work on membranes and talk just before the end of the year, before Christmas, and I wish you all all the best. So um, first, I would like to say uh, this year was very good for me, as Elena mentioned. Uh, I got the the L'Oreal Award for Women in Science. Um, and I'm not showing that to show to talk about myself, but I'm showing that because in membrane we are very privileged to have top women in science. So it's not a surprise that we have. Uh, uh, to, for me, I think it's, it's to to build on on many before me uh, really uh, had a very strong contribution, and also with the colleagues that I have that are super active in this field. So you should this this uh, image. Uh, years ago, I was part of the, the EMS Council, so before joining COWS. And the two co really, you have to be nominated to be part of the Council, to compete for the uh, place in the Council. And, and the two who nominated me are uh, these two wonderful ladies that you see, Mariana Nienstrom and Miriam Balaba. Mariana was the president of uh, EMS and also we have uh, uh, other presidents, uh, uh, Lidieta, Christiana, and now Elena. And Isabel in this picture, is here. she was uh, from NAMS president. And we have uh, many others in other parts of the world. I'm just highlighting those who are in EMS president mainly. And I would like to say also in the beginning of my career, when I was doing my PhD, uh, my talk, well, my topic was on on uh, irreversible thermodynamic or um, membrane transport, but uh, it was uh, a non-equilibrium thermodynamic. At that time, so I was uh, all the time reading a book from Kaczowski, um, who was the supervisor of Ora Keden. Ora Keden is a pioneer in membranes. I think uh, most of, we also from my generation, at least we know her, uh, really admire her for, 
the way she worked, not only for her own or career on that. I think those who are young feel privileged to be in this field, which is a STEM field, but with a lot of uh, uh, achievement in, in women. And the new generation that is coming, this, I like this picture, it's a picture taken a year ago. It was the commencement at KAUST and they are from my group. So it's uh, uh, really, I think we have all to have more and more success in the field of memory. But let me talk about science. And uh, this picture you see um, is a picture in the Museum of Science in, in Paris showing how the temperature is increasing in, in our uh, world today. And as you know, if you follow uh, discussions, news, and the COP28 uh, that was a couple of weeks ago, you see that it's almost, almost impossible to keep the 1.5 degrees temperature uh, not exceeding that. So uh, we all have to work to really do our best to contribute for a low carbon footprint. And um, you, if you live at KAUST, um, you see that not only because we know all the, the discussions on TV on, on all kinds of uh, literature and that, but we are surrounded by coral reef at KAUST. And coral reefs are really nice. It's a, like you see this picture, a picture from my son. Um, but you see that this is another picture of uh, coral reefs very close to cows. And although they look very nice, you see that when they become white and lila, and so it's a sign that they are dying. So it's uh, when it's too hot and they start to uh, really have uh, problems uh, of hopefully recovering, well, many times they don't. And uh, this is, of course, because of... Uh, uh, CO2 emission all over the world. And uh, if you see a report, a recent report from the IPCC, um, in great part, this the contribution for CO2 and for energy consumption is the energy plants themselves, 34%, uh, is coming from the industry, from transport, agriculture, and building. And membranes could do... Uh, um, have a strong contribution to reduce that if we work in different part, kinds of these fields. So this is an image here from, from the UN uh, on um, showing where CO2 emission is strongest. So like energy plants, transport, buildings, and industry, like I showed in the previous slide. Um, so, but membranes could work for CO2 separation, they could they work for electrolysis of uh, hydrogen technology. They are part in very important part of fuel cell for batteries um, or the humidifiers in air conditioners. And but mainly, what we frequently forget is the separation in the chemical industry. If you look again on the report of the IPCC. You see, I like very much this table. This is very clear uh, where the opportunities for reducing or for action in climate. So that means how can we most effectively reduce the CO2 emission? And if it's a dark red, it's more expensive. If it's a blue, it's less expensive. And if you see the bars here as longer, it's because it is more effective. And when you see that, CO2 capture alone is not as effective as we think. So I think many of the discussions that we have today, uh, not only for membranes, but a lot of technology, is emphasize so much the CO2 capture, which is also important, but is not alone the most uh, effective. So if we could work for an industry that is becoming more effective in terms of process, in separation process, we might have much more impact than the CO2 capture itself. We just should co consider all kinds of contributions that we, we can have. And for membranes, the most effective contribution might not be the CO2 capture. 
So here, in another way to see that, there are predictions on how in the next, uh, like, 10 to 50 or 50 years, how the CO2 will be reduced or must be reduced. So you see, uh, I don't know if you see my course, or do you see that here in the way that we have 33.7 uh, compared to 0 0.16, uh, how CO2 capture would be effective in reducing the total. And as we proceed with more effective technology in, in different kinds of technology, we will end up reducing the emission because we will work with more effective energy, more effective industry. And at some point when we are already reduced a lot, uh, then the CO2 capture will make more sense. Um, but the membrane itself, membrane technology, can should be effective in uh, many other ways. So, for instance, um, if you go to the refiners that we have today, that we still have, and we continue to have for a few more years, we want it or not, uh, the way to deal with that would be to make it the separations more uh, sustainable, more more effective. So we could substitute part of the fractionations in the industry, in the chemical industry, pharmaceutical, if we would uh, have a technology which is more like uh, separations that are uh, much more effective. And membranes can do that with less energy consumption. Or if we think that in the sustainable future, we will have a more biorefineries instead of fossil um, compounds. So you're working on renewable feedstock, um, thermochemical biomass conversion, biochemical fermentation. In all this process, membrane can play a role um, in being really more effective than, than the process we have today. Or in e-refiners, that means working on electrolysis or, or blue hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen. So the hydrogen technology itself, which use a lot of uh, uh, electrical um, process, membrane can be also an important uh, component. So in all, for all that of that, uh, we have some neighbors which are already uh, very effective, but we, uh, we, we should have more uh, selective layers. We should have more effective ones. Uh, and there are many materials that are available today or, or that are emerging more and more that could be used for membrane. And not only my group, there are many groups in the world exploring them. So I don't work with metal organic framework, but there are a lot of groups on that. Covalent organic networks or frameworks, we have work, we work in, in part with that. Um, to the materials, uh, macrocycles, uh, or what you call artificial channels, different farmers of molecules that could work as a channel, or uh, even block of polymers. I will not show much about block of polymers in this case. I will show just one uh, example on interfacial polymerization. Um, so if you see here on the um, left side, this is a machine for producing membranes on by non-solvent-induced phasing separation, which is the most common one that you, if you work with membrane, you know that uh, in great part, we have this process. You, you cast a membrane, you immerse it in, in water, and that's a machine. This is a machine in my lab. So I show that to tell that all the nice um, materials that we use and you explore, we have always to keep in mind that not the fences, the, the best materials, maybe they cannot be transformed into a membrane uh, in a large application that we need for, you know, water treatment, desalination, chemical industry. They all require a huge amount or area of membrane. So we need to think in approach that will be simple, that will be scalable, that will be sustainable. Otherwise, we don't move um, further than the lab curiosity. So, but there are many processes or many applications of where membrane are already in the market and uh, not in the market, but applied to industry. 
These are few uh, examples like uh, an organic solvent and a filtration or gas separation or a separation in water, for instance, uh, application in industry for uh, catalyst recovery, for um, recovery of monomers, for um, emission control, separation of azeotropes, hydrocarbon polishing, solvent dehydration, lower energy demand in, in, in systems and in industrial process. So these are, are many processes I know, for instance, uh, GMT or that you, you know, if you know Klaus Peinemann from uh, one of the founders on GMT. So these are all uh, processes that are already using in large scale membrane. But also, I, I think we will come with more membranes, more and more with IO separations and pro other applications where uh, water medium is, is still important. So if we think in terms of membranes being applied to industrial process, um, they need to be resistant in, in solvents and sometimes in, in a higher temperature as well. Um, I work with polymer membranes and I work with that because I'm a polymer scientist, but also because um, polymers are much easier to process in terms of membrane, of having uh, machines in, in, in large scale and, and, and then processing uh, ceramic membranes. And, but when you go into the industry, you need something that is insoluble in, in solvents because uh, it has to be used in, in a medium that usually is a chemical medium. But to process, you know that membranes are most of them prepared by a solution process. So you need a, a material, a polymer that will be process, processable, soluble in. So that's been a kind of paradox. You need to process, you need a material that's soluble, and but when the membrane is ready, must be insoluble. So as I mentioned, the, the, the list of uh, applications, so this, this is also a slide from, from GMT. If you, um, there are process, at least like hydrocarbon polishing, it's 25 tons per hour. So this is uh, uh, the scale that you have to think when we develop membranes. And the challenge for, especially for organic solvent nanofiltration, besides scalability, uh, we need much more precise uh, selectivity if we want to improve the success in the pharmaceutical industry. And we talk more and more about uh, recyclability of membranes. So it's not only to, to develop the membrane itself, but having the possibility at the end to recycle or to use uh, materials that are uh, from recyclable polymers. Uh, the, the membrane process itself, the, the membrane um, fabrication process must be sustainable. And since we use a lot of solvent, uh, we should explore uh, greener alternatives. And we also need, especially for OSN, a more standard um, um, way of characterizing that. So we still have every group a little bit different ways to characterization. Um, again, so if we work with a verse osmosis or, or, or organic solvent nanofiltration, um, polymers have a, a, a maybe a reputation that not being stable enough. But if you, you have a, some of the polymeric materials, they can go up to 500 degrees. Uh, I don't have here in this slide, but poly, polyoxidiazole or poly, polybenz, um, P, PBI, polybenzimidazole, goes up to 500 degrees. Uh, so these are just a few which are developed in, in different groups, uh, also in, in, in my lab as well. Um, at least 300 degrees is a, a, a temperature that we can find, easily find, polymers that can be transformed to membrane. So we were lucky enough to publish two papers in science last year uh, with the um, motivation targeting oil refineries or the fractionation of, of oil, not only for targeting oil itself, but uh, we wanted to have membranes that could be in a 
challenge in the environment or really in harsh conditions uh, to, to see how far we can go in terms of develop that to demonstrate that we can really use these membranes for, for the industry. And uh, the first one, so if here, it's a two completely different approaches. One is, is only phasing virtual membrane and the other one, which is a coating. Um, oil refiners, they work with a very complex uh, fractionation. Oils are very complex mixture and usually what you, they, it's used is distillation mainly. So how could membrane, the membrane I think it's not a, an expectation that membrane will substitute everything. But if part of this fractionation could be done by membrane, it's already um, making this, the, the process more sustainable. So the first approach is a thermally cross-linked polytriazole membrane. Polytriazole is a very stable polymer. It's, um, like it's, as I mentioned before, up to 300 degrees, 350 is still uh, possible to use it. But this is a polymer that is soluble in um, regular solvents like uh, um, DMF, NMP, but not only, in some green solvents, uh, ionic liquids also uh, soluble as well. So uh, we found out, and it's mainly the work of uh, Stefan Chiska, so he was a scientist in my lab. Uh, so, so this is a polytriazole with OH group, uh, side group, and we found out that it by heating, you can promote a cross-linking of this uh, polymer. So that means we first prepare the membrane. We can prepare the membrane with an asymmetric portal structure, like we see here on the, on the left side. And uh, you see we have a thin layer on the top just by uh, induced uh, phase separation. Uh, but And when we heat this membrane now, so the 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 glass transition temperature of this polymer is around 350 or so. When, when you heat it, so you have a relaxation of the uh, top layer, and this top layer become practically closed, completely, completely uh, selective. And at the same time, um, we don't lose the porosity because it's still on the range which is a bit below the glass transition temperature. So we could test the membrane for uh, crude oil or at least in, in a um, mixture of crude oil and, and toluene or so. And, and you see that is a, um, depending on, on the temperature that we promote the, the filtration, you can have uh, with the same membrane, you can have a, a different fractionations. So that means you go from the crude oil to different fractions of uh, oil. Um, the same polymer we tested also for gas separation. So the same polymer, if you don't stop the, the cross-linking at uh, 300, 350 degrees, but you continue to heat, you reach a temperature around 400 and 500 degrees where the, the, the fluorine, this uh, um, CF3, CF3 or CF, uh, this this um, group will be eliminated and you induce a free volume on the polymer. So, but if you do it in a very controlled way, you increase the permeance of the membrane. In this case here, measuring by time lag, that means permeability. You increase and you still keep a good selectivity for CO2 and other gases. So this is uh, one, one application that brings the, the, this kind of membranes to a very good uh, competitivity with other membranes that are available today. So even for um, mixed gases. Another polymer that is very stable, but because it's very so stable, it's difficult to process into membrane, is the polyketone series. So polyether ether ketone, polyether ketone ketone. So we have been using two different approaches for processing into membrane. So one, this work is a work in, in collaboration with Matthias Vesely, with the group of Matthias Vesely. So they produce um, um, spin edits for hollow fibers um, printed by 3D printing. 
So in, and when you have this kind of spinnerets, you you you're not using with a, a steel anymore. So it's a it's a, a, a material like a, a polymer also a cross-linked polymer, highly cross-linked polymer that is stable in the presence of a, of a peak solution in strong acids. You can produce the hollow fiber and you not so promoting corrosion or so like uh, would be a risk in a, a metallic uh, spinneret. The other approach is to modify the peak like uh, with a bulky group. So what we also have been explored and then you prepare the membrane, it becomes soluble. We prepare the membrane and we easily uh, eliminate the bulky group by uh, simply exposing to a solvent or to a, a solvent not, but to a chemical like acrylonitrile, I think that was we use, or uh, with some acid as well. But uh, a lot of work that we do is with interfacial polymerization. And interfacial polymerization is the same process that is used to prepare most of the desalination membrane or water, seawater desalination membrane. That means is is a very um, established method for preparation of membranes in large, large amount. So that means, and the advantage is that you have a very, um, you need much less monomers. You, you prepare the membrane uh, as support, portal support, and you still um, need a, a more selective layer, but this more selective layer is thinner than 100 nanometers. So then we can afford using more um, uh, expensive monomers or things that are not so, so, so you, you don't need uh, to be so concerned about costs. I think if you are working with membranes, you know how it works. So you have a, one um, chemical in our aqueous uh, medium, the other chemical in organic medium. They don't mix. They only, the chemicals, the reactants will only react at the interface and you collect the membrane, the thin layer, selective layer on a port of support. Um, in the desalination membrane, you use typical monomers is what you see in the bottom of these slides. You have a, a trimesoil chloride, which is soluble in the organic phase, and you have amino groups, uh, amino monomers soluble in water. But these are usually very hydrophilic membranes. If you work with hydrophobic membranes like oil for oil separation, you want to have a very hydrophobic path for your uh, organic molecules. And this again, this is a, a collaboration. This is mainly the work of a PhD student of uh, Andrew Livingstone. Uh, and it was a, a collaboration also with the, um, with the industry, with the Exxon as well. Um, the approach here is to have instead of uh, the regular amino uh, reactants, is to have an oligomer, a, a block oligomer, so like a block of polymer, so uh, oligomer is a small block of polymer. So you have a, a part, um, a central part here, which is a hydrophilic reactive zone, so to produce the reaction, really. And you have a hydrophobic part, which uh, can be... Um, constituted by different um, monomers or different uh, segments. It could be fluorinated one or could be a non-fluorinated one, but very hydrophobic. When you do it in this way, you have, uh, um, uh, you, in the aqueous phase, you will have the uh, amino oligomers forming a kind of uh, vesicles. And but this vesicle will be will have amino groups, and the amino groups will react in the interface with the uh, trimesoyl chloride. Uh, when you have that, you form a selective layer that has this channel. So, like you see in a uh, if you have a cross section, that you see some bumps. But this is a, a really the areas where you practically can consider as a hydrophobic channels for transport transport of uh, uh, of apolar uh, components like from crude oil for instance so if you have a mixture a complex mixture of uh, very hydrophobic uh, um, molecules 
depending on size or polar polarity, you will have a, a fractionation using this membrane. So you see on the on the right side, um, like uh, um, more components on on the top, which are preferential in the permeate, and on the bottom, uh, preferential on the retentate. And you can, yeah, these are quite uh, progress on that. But these are two examples where with oil fractionation, um, we demonstrate for oil, doesn't need to be necessarily oil. It could be also in, in, in a pharmaceutical product or in systems where your main compound is very hydrophobic, apolar molecules. But we might be, we are interested also in, in uh, applications in pharmaceutical industry where you have a lot of different steps for separation. But if you would have a very precise separation or selective layers, much more selective than we have, we can uh, reduce the number of steps and make this whole system, this whole process more, more sustainable. Uh, what we are uh, using, uh, uh, what I favor, what I think is an interesting approach is uh, uh, to use, instead of having the um, amino, uh, more random polymerized uh, monomers, is to use macrocycles, so different forms. You can you have different ones available today. Um, then, like you see in some of the, uh, in these slides here. So there are, you can think of it as a pre-pore, so something that is already a pore in the size of uh, like six angstroms. So it's close to the size of many molecules that we want to separate in, in pharmaceutical use. Uh, you can add that in different forms. You can add like mixture in, in the selective layer, a kind of a mixed matrix, or you can have a, a, a porous membrane where you functionalize the pores, you close the pore with the, a macrocycle, or you can use the macrocycle itself as a monomer for the interfacial polymerization. And I think this is the what where we want really where we have been explored more, because then if you don't lose the you don't dilute the the function of this macrocycle, you have a highly cross-linked one where uh, the permeant doesn't have a much other chance than to go through the microcycle. So then you control who will pass by controlling the size of the macrocyte. This is a, uh, we have been working with cyclodextrin, um, have good papers on, on, on that, we continue to work on that. Or we have uh, uh, this, uh, uh, a triangular mine, which is a collaboration with a colleague at Kaos, uh, Nivin Kashab, which they produce, uh, uh, this is the form of a triangle, so, uh, but the size is more, the diameter, is more or less like the size of a cyclodestrin, six, around six angstrom. So, and we had a test, so where you see here on the, um, on the right side, we prepare the same, use the same chemistry, but not in the form of a microcycle, just using a, the same chemistry, but uh, randomly polymerized or cross-linked. And you see that something that in the triangular mine has a, 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 a rejection of practically 100% of molecules with 700 grams per mole, if you use uh, the, the non-macrocycle, you have um, a rejection that goes be, below 20% of rejection. And this is because in the, uh, with the macrocycle, you have a much less free space, you, you really, force the molecules to go through the macrocycle. We have uh, explored other um, monomers, or, or other really maybe more complex monomers, like a cage, or um, in which is uh, really more like you can imagine that's like a 3D pores already. Uh, and in this slide, you see two uh, examples, uh, one which is a more rigid one on the uh, right side and one which is a more flexible one. Um, in the more rigid one, you have a, a more sharp um, curve of a rejection on molecular weight, which is not a surprise to have that. 
the advantage of having the the on the the right side the that cage we did it is a work of Shang Li or another postdoc in my lab uh, also in collaboration with Nivin Kashab's group um, so he induced the formation of a, a palladium uh, catalyst inside this cage so the idea was to have it uh, as a, a selective layer which is also uh, reactive well, I would not say that this is the most simple, simple approach, uh, but this uh, approach where you combine catalytic ac activity and uh, selectivity. So the other example I wanted to show is not the selectivity, which is the main uh, goal. Here is the permeance, uh, the high permeance for water. It's a completely different application, but in terms of sustainability, it's also important because if you consider countries like Saudi Arabia, where I live most of my time nowadays, is uh, uh, air condition is the super important. And it's not only the temperature, it's also the humidity control. So first, if you reduce the humidity and in the area where cows is, like an, in the, close to the sea, uh, sometimes in summer can be very, very humid. But it's not only Saudi Arabia. Many countries in Europe are facing the same problem in, in summer. High temperature, high humidity. And uh, uh, if you have a very high humidity combined with high temperature, your copper cannot, so the, the water coming out of you, the, the, uh, if you sweat, you don't, uh, you, you, you stop sweating. So you, you cannot... Uh, the, the temperature will not be reduced by evaporation of water on your skin. So then at some point you can really have a risk of, of breakdown, of heat stroke. So for different reasons then you need to reduce humidity in the house or in, in any place that you are. So one possibility is to use membrane systems for that. And we are working on, on device made of a hollow fiber um, where you have, you produce the hollow fiber, where we produce the model itself, and then uh, we have a coating on the hollow fiber to tune the, uh, the, the effectivity of this um, device. So we can produce, so we have the whole system. This is in terms of scalability, we can produce in our own lab the, the, um, the, the hollow fiber. Uh, the fiber itself, we can produce the, um, the module ourselves. Um, and the coating, we test, we can, again, is a thin coating, we can afford different kinds of coatings. So from a block of polymer, Nexa, which has very, very um, uh, permeable channels, or we can use uh, capsules uh, containing different compounds, like a uh, natural ionic liquid, which is very, very uh, hygroscope, that has uh, really the capacity of taking a lot of water. Uh, well, we have a different product. We don't go into detail, don't have time for that. But uh, one of the approaches that we recently published is uh, published just recently in, in Journal Membrane Science use uh, a combination of tannic acid and hyperbranch polyethylene mine, which are cheap materials, which are relatively simple but very effective in terms of uh, the humidification. Uh, with a relatively simple reaction, we have a coating uh, that can be uh, really super effective in terms of, uh, of the humidification. Uh, we tested even a very, very long time, so 400 days you see here, uh, and it has stable fibers and stable system, and which are much, um, this blue, triangles on the bottom of the slide or, or the, the green ones, um, they are modules tested uh, based on this material and they are much more effective than, than using like a, what is common, like a liquid desiccant or solid desiccant. So in summary, I think that's uh, uh, most of the overview that I wanted to show you. I think we, we work also in other topics. We work on, on um, sustainable membrane uh, fabrication. We worked on, on um, block of polymers. We worked for very long, continue to work uh, 
we have a collaborations on using block of polymer membranes and, and functionalizing them for different bio applications or so. But uh, for today, it's what I wanted to show. Uh, we can really help in terms of sustainability in target uh, more effective process industry on fractionation of complex mixtures, uh, uh, enable new process that uh, maybe are not possible today by distillation, maybe all because the product itself is thermodegradable. So we, we could uh, use membrane for that. We are using membrane for that already. Uh, we can substitute some of the process in the industry. And in this way, as I mentioned before, so you might be even more effective in reducing CO2 emission than to just continue to do the same traditional process that we have in count of, of having a minor part of this CO2 produced in the same of, uh, in the way of applying additional capture process technologies that might require energy for running the technology themselves. So at the end, it, I personally think we should invest much more in substitution of part of the process that we have in the industry than purely applying CO2 capture. Or as I mentioned, air dehumidification is part of the applications of membrane itself. So I have to think um, what I show here, collaboration with uh, uh, Klaus Beinema, uh, one, and Georgi Sekeli, the, uh, with Niveen, uh, with the Kaos Collab, uh, the work on, on the um, oligomers, block oligomers, and mainly the group of uh, Andrew Livingstone, uh, the work of uh, Matthias Vesely. But we collaborate with uh, other groups of work that I don't uh, didn't show here. Um, I want to mention a, a conference that uh, George Sekeli and, my, and uh, myself are organizing in, in March next year, first days of March. Uh, you can have a look on this uh, on the website of the conference, and you're welcome to apply. We have uh, uh, for students. We still have some grants that uh, we we um, support for participation, and travel, and uh, yeah, yeah. I hope to see many of you at Kaos in March. Uh, this is a picture of Kaos, as you see. I think is a nice place to explore and, and see, know more about the Middle East. And finally, so happy holidays for all of you. So Christmas is coming in a few days and a new year for all of you. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Susanna, really interesting presentation. And we have already different questions. So I think let's start, first of all, is uh, Lidieta that was thanking you also for introducing her as a woman in science. But let's start from scientific question. Uh, Niaz Ali Khan, is there any room to find application for using the reverse osmosis membrane instead of the discharging them? Uh, you mean to recycle the membranes? Huh? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I think that's, a, that's an important topic uh, that we are working on that. So the, the, I think the main challenge is the membranes are multi-layers and uh, the, the module itself is, is uh, you have the membrane, you have the case, of, uh, you have the module. It's a complex uh, system. I think there are different groups working on that. Uh, we have to find solutions for at least some uh, approach. I think some groups are just using the membrane that is, uh, or a, a device that is a reverse osmosis, maybe the membrane is not so acceptable for reverse osmosis, using for other process and so, but I, I think this is not the, the solution at the end. I think it's, uh, um, I think we have to rethink the way that you prepare the membranes uh, to maybe use more sustainable materials, more recyclable materials as well. Abdul Wahid, I don't know if the pronunciation is correct. Mm -hmm. uh, he have a question regarding the solubility of microcycles mm -hmm. in aqueous yeah. medium. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, they are not always soluble. This is a, this is a, not easy. Not all the time. We have to uh, we 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 face that um, because they are larger molecules. Um, but you can play. You will see in, in some of our papers. We don't use pure water. We use sometimes you play with the pH, or sometimes we add. Um, I think like a. Uh, in one of the papers, a, a fluorinate, a fluor alcohol, um, or or you can add a bit of the of uh, solvents like DMF or so. Uh, you have to play with the solution because not all is soluble in pure water. Yeah, but it's possible. It's not uh, uh, it's not too complicated to find solutions. Is also another question. Uh, if we use an acidic medium, the reactivity of the microcyclic amine will be compromised. How yes. to handle this challenge? <laughs> yes, you're right. You know well the case. Uh, yeah, you have to find the balance. Um, yeah, we we. I know you 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 can if you if you reduce the pH. There's some point that you don't have the reactivity is is, is lower. Um, yeah, you find you have to find a, a compromise. In some case, we could do it by reducing the pH. In some case, to to increase the reactivity, we had to add um, a bit of a solvent that is, uh, as long as you can still keep the the um, emissible the the phase the, the organic phase and the uh, aqueous phase, you can you still have a room. But yes, it's not a all is straightforward. <laughs> it's a, some work to do. Is also another question by Niaz Al Khan. Um, thanks for such an important presentation. I want to ask what are the major challenges faced by membranes in widespread application? Except some desalination plants, membranes still haven't found broad acceptance. Um, I would disagree with you. Because, uh, of course, desalination is the best um, uh, success story because it's of course, in, in the Middle East and in place in Spain, or so, it's, uh, there's no other way. So there's uh, uh, really a reverse osmosis uh, um, desalination is the, the predominant process today so and you don't buy membranes. So the, the, there's still uh, also thermal desalination, but the, Membrane desalination is is widespread. It's, maybe you cannot compare the industry, but I show you one slide where I mention a application in an industry which is uh, was uh, I think twenty or twenty five tons per hour. So this is is a huge amount, and this is not a, a dream. This is a, a implemented process. I know very well that uh, the company that's doing that. So it's, uh, uh, yeah, it, it is part of, th there's a lot of industry, some of the industry they are already using, they don't want you to know exactly that they're using, they are not declaring so much <laughs> uh, because the kind of uh, like competition also, which kind of process they use. But it's uh, not true that the membrane is not being used in, in, in chemical already it is um i know very well yes so and nino gaeta that thank you suzanne for interesting presentation you have convinced us about the important scientific progresses in membrane application can you say if there are already industrial pilot tests based on the results you have presented if so can you say where you know, it's a pleasure to, to have you and the audience. Really, I miss you a lot. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the results that I show, I focus on new materials. So, I, I mean, I, I showed the applications on, on, on in general, like the, the beginning of the, the talk, which were membranes, like membranes from, I know, from GMT, from, from Klaus. And so they are in different companies, in also in petrochemical companies. And so they... Um, not not only pilot plants, big plants. Um, the the results that I show that were microcycles and so they are still uh, in a research uh, uh, phase. They are not uh, 
uh, in a pilot scale yet. Uh, yes, I, I have also thank MS for organizing this webinar. I have to say that we also had uh, last time also people from uh, Synthet. So we are trying to combine both scientific but also application. And uh, mm -hmm. it's clear that uh, there are also nice examples, maybe not so many what we working in membrane area would mm -hmm. expect. <laughs> this is the point, but for sure this uh, uh, process, this technology will be much more worse spread in the, in the future. I think we are really mm. optimistic about this. Mm. I have a question uh, about membrane dehumidification because it's really new but really important uh, mm. uh, process, I'll say activity. And uh, have you thought to uh, also the reuse of water because at the moment it just seems just yeah. keeping water from the environment that for comfort mm. and also for the other uh, industrial reason, but also uh, going a little bit beyond reusing that water that especially in some area where is really high humidity this is something that uh, do you think we will go in this direction yes i think we should consider that so if you see uh, normal um, air conditioning you see how much water comes from the yes. from the air so yeah i think it's you have to think about that so in we we are not testing there we're not uh, at this moment targeting the the recover of water, but it's yes, I think it's uh, important. Yeah. Yeah. So, so changing also from also hydrophilic also to hydrophobic. Mm -hmm. Clearly, it's different mechanism, but uh, for yeah. sure, it's also another way. I have to say that uh, it was really interesting, uh, really new hints, uh, a lot of people asking, and mm -hmm. uh, we had also different. Uh, not so many, but really good number of people following uh, now online. Mm -hmm. And for sure, this uh, webinar will be uh, visualized also by others because we had, uh, we are checking that every month is are a lot of visualization of the past uh, webinars. <laughs> so <laughs> I would like to thank you um, for being so, such nice example for uh, for us, I'd say as women, but also as scientists in general. And um, I would like just now to uh, show some uh, uh, new slides. Stay with us here. I, I would like just to uh, share some slides referring the uh, activities of European Membrane Society. As you know, uh, these are the activities that we foresee next year. I'm just giving some hints. We will continue to have uh, our webinars. Generally, is every first Wednesday, but depends. Like here, we were the third, but it was also a nice occasion to uh, give the, how to say the uh, happy holidays to mm -hmm. everybody and uh, uh, in 2023 we have 10 webinars apart January and August that are uh, just coming back from holidays or holiday period almost for Europe uh, we keep a monthly webinar so this uh, we would like to have this as a, a traditional meeting point uh, for the uh, people um, of um, European Member Society uh, the announcement is that we have also the 39th uh, European Membrane Society Summer School next year in Louvain Le Neuve in Belgium. The mm -hmm. date, please fix the date 10 to 14 June 2024. We have here the uh, website and uh, it is organized by the group of Patricia Lewis. Uh, early bird registration date is April two, uh, 22, so it's enough time, but please consider the date. Clearly, we have the traditional Euromembranes. It will be in Prague, September 8 to 12. Fix also these dates. And uh, the abstract submission deadline is fixed to March 8. Uh, clearly, we have uh, here described the uh, the plenary speakers, but as usual, you will find a lot of uh, keynote and uh, really interesting days. So please fix also these dates. And uh, I would like to mention that we are really proud also that uh, you can also have here the job uh, offer that are especially for any kind of position, not only uh, not permanent, but also some permanent. And this is also a good contact, not only with academia, but also are some 
uh, industries that are asking us to uh, promote this activity, industries that are also a member of the society. Plus, you can see also our, how to say, um, social uh, channels. First of all, the web page. Elsa, that is also our secretary, is sending anytime the messages to all the members. But you can find also messages from uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube also. And um, we are stopping our activity to this. But if there are young people that would like also to give the help for new uh, channels, we are really happy uh, to host also them. And uh, uh, an important point uh, will be the PhD survey on PhD thesis on membrane science and engineering. Uh, we would like to make a special issue for the uh, membrane newsletter. And uh, so we are collecting theses, the abstract of thesis defended in Europe and neighboring countries. So it's uh, quite a uh, huge, as to say, area during the last four years, to, from 2020 to, to, to 2023. Uh, you can download the abstract template and you can send this word file to Lidietta Giorno, that is the uh, member newsletter editor, directly to this uh, uh, email. Please, no later than 15 January 2024. Uh, anyway, you can find these uh, uh, you can fix both uh, the email, but also the how you can download the abstract template uh, in X on also on the website. So you can, as you go to our social media, you can find this information, and we are really um, happy to receive all the message that you will send us. And uh, with the last slides is we wish you happy holidays. Uh, here are the people of the uh, council and also Elsa, that is really our useful uh, uh, secretary that really helped a lot. And with this, I wish you happy holidays. So Merry Christmas, uh, um, clearly happy new year. So happy holidays to everybody. Uh, let's meet again in January or in February. Uh, and for the next webinar. Thank you again, Susanna, for being with us. And thank you. It's a pleasure. Bye bye. bye. Well, it is. <laughs> bye.